Okay, my name is Matthew Shepherd. I am a soil biodiversity specialist for Natural England, which means it's my job to look after all of the life in the soil, and there's an awful lot of it. So I thought I'd introduce you to some of it as well. I thought I'd start my story, however, up here in Scotland. This is um, uh, the little village of Rhiney. And the reason I'm starting here is because um, about 100 years ago, a geologist wandering through this village spotted a rock like this in the walls and thought, and a dry stone wall, and thought, I'm not entirely sure why I know what that is. And he pulled it out, and he got it under a microscope, and he discovered that actually what it is is a fossil it's called the Rhiney Chert, named after the village, of this habitat. It's from the late Ordovician, early Devonian period. And this was a really critical moment in Earth's history because at, at this very moment, life began to start on land. Up until that point, there was no life on land at all. It was literally just dust blowing around, effectively. And um, plants began to crawl out of the ocean and occupy just the fringing areas of the land. And this Rhiney Chert had fossilised this very moment, pretty much of the plants beginning to come out of the sea and onto the land, the very beginning, this is the beginning of farming, if you like. <laughs> you know, this is where plants started growing on land. And um, what's really interesting about this fossil is it's not only fossilised just the plants there, but also the creatures that were crawling around the roots of the plants in the soil. And here's a couple of the pictures of the um, creatures that they found there. This one here is called Rhyniella, and um, you can see it's got a pair of antennae and six legs and a funny little tube sticking out of its tummy. This one here has got eight legs, a pair of pincers for mouth parts. And what's really interesting about these 400 million year old animals found in these Rhiney Cherts is that actually we more or less get exactly the same animals crawling around the roots of plants today. The very first land animals were soil animals. That's worth remembering, the land plants probably could not have colonised the land without these soil animals. And ever since then, 400 million years of Earth's history has passed. And these soil animals have continued in much the same way, like six legs, pair of antennae, little tubes sticking out of its tummy there, still exactly the same, almost. They've continued to support those land plants. And we've come along in the past hundred million years and think that we know how to deal with soil. So let's explore that concept a little bit. So 400 million years of um, life on Earth. Before that 400 million years, of course, as I said, there was sand, silt and clay blowing around the Earth's surface, washing around the Earth's surface. And curiously, sand, silt and clay is often where a lot of soil scientists stop. You'll have seen this triangle before, won't you? As describes very nicely the different sort of building blocks, the scaffolding of soil, if you like. The big sand particles, much smaller um, silt particles, and infinitesimally small submicroscopic clay particles. And within those three things, yeah, it explains a certain amount of the soil property, but actually in many ways this is the least interesting part of soil to a biologist. This is like the scaffolding that holds soil together. Because soil... That triangle fits into this part, mineral particles. A typical mineral soil, however, can be mostly air and water. It's mostly space. Space for life to live in, space for organisms to wriggle around in. Here are the organisms here. Only making up 10%, but they've got all this space to run around in. Furthermore, there's also humus and other organic matter, and plant roots as well make up a large percentage of the soil too. And there's certainly a large percentage of the soil organic matter. But even this doesn't give you the full picture of what soil is, because we've got our mineral materials, we've got our organic matter, and we've got space to wriggle around in, whether it's through air or through water. But this doesn't give you the full picture either, because soil is structured. Soil, if you can imagine it as a place to live, if you're one of those soil organisms, is like a, a network of caves. And we've got a really nice x-ray tomograph from the University of Nottingham here, which actually shows you the space in the soil. This is like soil minus the soil, if you like. This is just the air and the water. And you can see in this one, well-structured soil, there are great long channels running down. This is a sort of infinite fractal cave system, really complicated, really difficult to explore your way around. Lots of space to live, lots of space for things to happen, for biological processes to happen. This one here is a compacted soil, and you can see much less space. It's the same volume of soil, but look, it's only where we've got root channels running through that we've actually got any space at all for those organisms to live. So just bear that in mind as well. We're looking at a cave system, and the bigger the cave system, the more complicated the cave system, the more life you'll get in there. So how much life do we get in there? Well, in an arable soil, typically, <coughs> it's worth um, thinking about it in terms of five tonnes of soil organisms. That's what you tend to get in your, in your hectare of arable soil. And that's the equivalent of about 100 sheep. So there's my 100 sheep scattered across a hectare. I've tried to keep the sheep and the, the hectare more or less to scale there. So, I mean, it's quite, quite a busy field, I suppose. Quite well stocked with soil organisms. But this is an arable field, and in arable fields, you can see there's not a lot for these sheep to eat, and there's not a lot for the soil organisms to eat either. On a grassland, this is the picture. 
I tried to fit 2,000 sheep into my hectare here and probably crashed my computer with all those little tiny graphics. So 2,000 sheep's worth of soil organisms, 50 tonnes per every hectare in a typical grassland field. Now imagine that scaled up over every single hectare that you own or that you manage or that you're interested in. And you begin to realise that we're actually talking about a very, very large biomass of organisms that are influencing the way that the planet works. So yes, 2,000 sheep in every hectare. I think that um, the RPA might have something to say about that. <laughs> It's also worth pointing out that these, although soils can be very deep, they can be you know, 12 metres depth of peat in the Somerset levels, you know, typically uh, you know, a couple of metres maybe, or a metre or so around here perhaps, the majority of our soil organisms are really just in that top 15 centimetres of soil. And there's a reason for that, is because actually when you're up in the top 15 centimetres of soil, that's where most of the caves are bigger. As you go down, the caves get smaller and smaller and fewer and fewer. There's less space to live. And the other difference is, is to do with the organic matter. Where is the organic matter going in? Where's the fuel for the system? And I'll keep coming back to this idea of fuel for soil biology. It's coming in at the top, and that's why we get the majority of the soil organisms at the top. This is a graph just showing the number, total number of nematodes as an example. And we've got many different systems. We've got a, uh, a woodland system here. We've got a, uh, a, sorry, that's the woodland system. Loads and loads up at the top, dropping down quite rapidly. But also, even if you have a, a fallow field or a maize field, you get a similar sort of pattern. That's the maize field there, so not doing too well at all. But even so, you still get more at the surface than you do at the bottom. So that's a typical pattern. If you start looking for soil organisms a metre and a half down, you're not going to find very many. Also, let's think about it in terms of numbers and size. Now, bacteria and fungi are the smallest. They call them microorganisms because <laughs> it takes a microscope, sometimes a very serious microscope, to see them and appreciate them. But you can have 100 billion fungi in your handful of soil, and up to 50 kilometres of fungal hyphae in that handful of soil. So uh, you tend to get also a lot of diversity, a huge amount of diversity, a very large number of, of individual organisms or lengths of hyphae. As the organisms get bigger, you get fewer of them. So when you get to protozoa and nematodes, we're only talking about 100,000 to 10,000 of maybe 100 different species. Again, as we get bigger organisms, these are the ones you can actually begin to see with the microscopes that we've got out here. And these are the springtails and the mites and so on that I've already introduced you to with that um, slide with the riny chirps. And you might get, actually 5,000 would be quite a lot in a handful. I suspect maybe 500 or so would be typical. And maybe get 100 different species easily of mites and springtail and other little creatures crawling around. And these are only just big enough to see. So it just will take a microscope to see them. Then, of course, when things get even bigger to see, like badgers and rabbits and um, uh, <laughs> moles and so on, you actually only get, well, one thousandth of a mole in your handful of soil. Well, that would be a bit, a bit messy, under one point zero zero one of a species of mole. So it's a scaling thing. But as you can see, we also, however, still have plant roots, and they are extremely important. You can have 500 metres of plant roots in that handful of soil. So imagine that all um, acting in that single handful. There's an awful lot of microbes. An awful lot of these plant roots, these are hard to see, these you can see, these are the ones we're going to be mainly looking at today, because they're ones that you can actually see and they do reflect the whole system. So let's start with plants, because plants are, after all, often forgotten as soil organisms. They are the soil organism par excellence, they're also the only soil organism that produces you know, significant amounts of carbon into the system. There are a few bacteria that can do the same, but for the most part, plants are the fuel source. So just think of plants as being fuel for soil. And they're also soil organisms, because you can see this is a, um, a, a slide by a, a, a chap called Weaver who uh, worked on the prairies, the American prairies at the time of the Dust Bowl. I shall return to that. And they were very interested in the rooting depth of plants in the prairies, because at the time the farmers were ploughing them up. And he discovered they go down 12 feet into the ground, and he actually dug 12-foot trenches and mapped them out by hand, just to demonstrate that really, when you've got this much above ground and that much below ground, we really are talking about a soil organism <laughs> rather than an above-ground organism when we think of plants. And close up, this is what they look like. They look like soil organisms as well. They look weird. These are root hairs growing out of a, a root of perennial ryegrass. And each one of these root hairs is growing, dying, turning over, but also leaking carbon out into the soil as well. So these are supplying fuel right at that microscopic level, at the same level as the bacteria and the fungi are working at as well, which are actually even smaller potentially than these root hairs as well. So we've got plants which are providing the carbon source for the fuel. They're putting their roots right down into the, into the ground. So providing them really are the, the, the fuel source for the whole system. Now what comes to those root hairs? What begins to, to feast on the carbon that leaks out of those root hairs? Well, largely it's bacteria. They are, the, in many systems, the most common microorganism, the most common organism in the soil. It's only in forests you begin to get more fungus, really, than bacteria. So in most of the soils we're dealing with, it'll be these chaps. Um, you tend to get a wide range of different ones. These are alpha proteobacteria, are very, very common right the way across um, um, 
most of the uh, agricultural soils, they get rarer as the soils get more acid. In uh, semi-natural habitats and other habitats, you get a lot of these actinobacteria. These are what give soil its smell, incidentally. And um, uh, like many bacteria, these are chemical factories. They're producing all sorts of different interesting chemicals, which they use just to help themselves in their everyday life in the soil. And um, uh, so these ones here, the uh, proteobacteria, I think, have produced penicillin, of course. We also have... Um, uh, Sorry, no, penicillin is a fungal one, sorry. The, um, sorry, the actinobacteria produce actinomycin, which is an anti-cancer drug. And I don't know if um, uh, you probably used avomectins and ivermectins for treating uh, worms and, and scabies or whatever, <laughs> um, mange infestations and so on. That's actually produced by these bacteria. It was a soil bacteria that produced it in the first place. So they're chemical factories. And the reason they're chemical factories is that they, it's their job to break down almost every chemi chemical in the soil. So many of the bacteria are really hard to culture as well. Most of the bacteria as you get towards the acid stage are acidobacteria, which we only discovered about 25 years ago using genetics. We didn't even know they were there before because we could only find the bacteria that we could culture in a petri dish. And they're also in more waterlogged soils, firmicutes as well. And they're found in all soils, but these tend to be the ones that can be pathogenic as well. Also, curiously, in really tough soils, you get archaea. In fact, you get archaea in all, almost all soils. But these aren't even bacteria. If you go right the way back to the beginning of time, the tree of life branched very early on. Bacteria went one way, archaea went another way. They still look like bacteria and in many ways fulfill similar functions, but they live in tougher environments. So these are the creatures that you'll find at the bottom of a peat bog producing methane, for instance, or indeed at the bottom of the ocean, living on almost nothing at all. So there's a bacteria, chemical factories, and major decomposers and breaking down organic matter. Also, breaking down organic matter and also major decomposers are fungi. And people tend to think of fungi, especially conservationists, will go out and say, oh, what, what can we find growing in the, in, in the woodlands? And they'll go out in fungal forays and see beautiful, beautiful fungus like this. Plums and custard there on the right. But in fact, this is how I like to think of fungi. A network of tiny microscopic tubes spreading out through the soil and doing much the same job as the bacteria. So they're breaking down organic matter, binding soil particles together. You can see this one's actually ensnared a few lumps of sand in its hyphae there. And around here as well, that's the mineral particles being bound together by the fungi. So this is how I like to think of fungi, and they do much the same job as the bacteria, and in fact, because they do the same job, they don't like to share each other's territory. And this is why fungi, like penicillin, have produced antibacterial compounds that we now use as antibiotics. It's because they were fighting the bacteria off in the soil, saying, hey, get off my patch. <coughs> it's also worth pointing out that fungi are amazing. The largest and the oldest organism in the world. It's about nine and a half um, square kilometres. It's so large, you can't take a photograph of it. You need a map. And it's called the humongous fungus. That's the, the, the biggest <laughs> one there. It's actually, uh, you'll be disappointed to hear a, a, a disease-causing fungus. It's one of the honey funguses that attacks living trees. But it's found you know, sufficient numbers of living trees to spread out through these forests in Oregon to about nine and a half square kilometres. And it's estimated to be at least two and a half thousand years old. So in terms of the, um, uh, you know, life on the planet. And what's also interesting about fungus as well, right at the very beginning when plants were coming out, they started teaming up with fungus. So remember that picture of the uh, Ordovician Devonian landscape? At that point, they've also found, fossilised in similar remains, the very first fungus root interactions. And we call these mycorrhiza. Myco means fungus, rhiza means root. So mycorrhiza. And here's one, an example of them. This is, where the, um, this is a plant root, but you can't see the root at all. This has come from a pine seedling. And the pine root is somewhere inside here, but it's been covered with a glove of fungal hyphae, which have wrapped all the way around the root. And it's not actually causing any harm, because what this is doing is going out into the soil around and foraging for nutrients and recycling the nutrients out of the litter from the pine tree and feeding them straight back into the pine again. And um, in return for this, the, car um, the fungus will get a little bit of carbon from the roots as well, <coughs> and it gets supported by the tree. So the tree is supporting the, the fungus, and the fungus is supporting the tree by feeding nutrients back. You don't tend to get these often in agricultural crops, but you do still get mycorrhizas, and these are the sorts that you get in, in a typical agricultural crop. These are called um, arbuscular mycorrhizas, and they're called that because of the way they make little bush-shaped structures inside the, the cell walls of the, uh, of the plant root. But what they've done here is they've stained the root um, using a special dye that picks up just the mycorrhizal hyphae and dyes it fluorescent green. And you can see here that actually it's right the way through the inside of this root. There's lots of little tiny squiggles. It also spreads out very, very fine threads out into the surrounding soil. And the reason that these are so successful is because these very, very fine hyphae can get into cracks and crevices in that fractal cave system that is the soil and capture nutrients that the plant root hairs would be far too fat and chubby to get into. What's also interesting about these kind of mycorrhizae is they've got these things, which are actually spores 
they're gigantic. Given the size of these hyphae, these are humongous spores. You can actually see these spores with the naked eye. They're that large. And that's quite unusual for fungus to see you know, such large spores. And the reason they need these large spores is these hyphae, these fungi, cannot survive without a plant root as a host. If you leave them in the soil, you take away the plant root, they will just wither away and die. So they need to be able to survive a long time until the next plant comes along that can support them. And this is how they do it. They form a big, round, resource-rich spore, and they sit in the soil and they tough it out. Now, these won't last forever, of course, as well, so if you never have a, a, a good host plant for that mycorrhiza, it won't work. But these are hugely important because almost every plant on the planet, it has a mycorrhizal association. Furthermore, they uh, enhance the growth of plants. It's been proven time and time again that with mycorrhizae, especially in no, low-nutrient um, regimes, then they will scavenge for phosphorus in particular, but also nitrogen to some extent, bring them through to the plant root. They're even important for getting water for the plant, because each one of these acts like a little canal, and water runs along the outside of those hyphae and comes back to the plant root. So it's supplying water and nutrients back to the plant and is um, getting in return a little bit of plant photosynthetic carbon. And in fact, these sorts only get their carbon from the plant. They can't. They've lost the ability to scavenge for carbon from the soil organic matter. And this is why they will die if you take the plant away. So there's mycorrhizas, very important, and we'll come back to them again. Getting bigger now, other microorganisms, still need a microscope to see some of these. These are protozoa. These swim around in the soil water, some of them acting like little animals hunting. This is a ciliate protozoan, and they swim around hunting down other bits of animals and, uh, and bits of organic matter. And they have little fringes in many cases, which they use for swimming, and even little mouths. Parts of their single cell have been adapted into a mouth, which it uses for swallowing things. Some of them live in shells, like this testate amoeba. The actual creature oozes out a little sort of pseudopodium of, uh, of slime out of one end in order to forage for things, and then sucks itself back in again when it's threatened. And this is microscopic. You can see these, especially in moss, actually. They turn up in moss, too. Some of them are not so microscopic. This is a slime mould, a plasmodial slime mould. And this is actually more or less one cell, but it's about that big. It's growing on a log. And this is a single cell with many, many nucleuses within it and it just oozes its way around. It can sometimes grow like a fungus, spreading out long, thin tendrils of itself into various crevices, and sometimes it just bunches together, and I think this one's about to sporulate, so I think it's a kind of mating behaviour that it does. But they're amazing things. Look up slime moulds on YouTube, incidentally, if you ever want to be amazed by things. I don't have time to go into it here. <clears throat> Nematodes is another step up. These are also swimmers around in the soil water. They don't really swim as so much as wriggle. They're actually terrible swimmers, and we can use that to our advantage when we're trying to extract them. We just let them float down through the water. But yes, wriggling across the water filmed on the soil surface will get nematodes. And before we go any further, nematodes obviously get a lot of bad press because there are a lot of <laughs> pest nematodes out there. Not least um, a potato cyst nematode, beet cyst nematode, and so on. But plant parasitic nematodes, which include all the problem ones, um, make up about 15% typically of nematodes in, a, in an agricultural soil. And all the rest of them are eating bacteria, or they're eating fungi, or they're eating everything that goes, including each other. And also, we have predators as well, and these predators are eating these nematodes and these nematodes. So in fact, actually, by having a wide range of different nematodes, you've got more of a sort of balance. And if you were to wipe out all of these nematodes with some sort of nematicide, you'll be taking out your problems, which are, you know, will be a, a chunk of that plant parasites. Remember, these plant parasites could be eating your weeds as well. But you'll also be taking out all the predators and all the food that the predators were previously feeding on as well. So you might be knocking out the, the solution to your problem as well as your problem. So how can you tell what a nematode eats? Well, I've said that, so uh, just ask it, of course. Now, we've got, um, <laughs> these are your problem nematodes. Nem nematodes that feed on plants, almost all of them have got a long needle in their mouth parts and a pair of little knobs at the end of that needle. So if you ever get a nematode under a microscope, you'll see it uses that like a hypodermic needle, sticks into the plant cell and drinks. They also seem to be very slow moving. And they tend to be a little bit armoured. This one's kind of annulated, ringed like a vacuum cleaner hose. So those ones will be your plant parasites. Coming along to eat the plant parasites will be these. Now these are just much bigger. Guess what this one is? It's a predator. It's got a huge mouth. And it's even got a great big jagged looking tooth. Some of them have got three teeth arranged in a sort of triangle inside. They're quite formidable looking beasts. And in fact, there was a terrible film in the 1980s called Dune where they invented some monsters and they were based on predatory nematodes. But yes, they're quite vicious looking things and they will engulf these. We also have the mild-mannered bacterial feeding nematodes, tend to be small. All they have really is just a hole for sucking bacteria into. So boring looking mouth parts, huge teeth, needles. Fungal feeding nematodes either have tentacles for grabbing hold of the fungal hyphae, like sort of chopsticks, or this one is actually sucking the juice out of the fungal hypha there as well, using a, a kind of curved stylet there. So it's another one with a stylet. You might get these confused, but these ones nearly always have these rings on them. So there we go, four different kinds of nematodes. 
And um, it's worth pointing out, although nematodes will feed on fungi, fungi will also feed on nematodes. The um, oyster mushroom, curiously, is a nematophagous fungus, and there are various other ones as well. This particular soil has got uh, little nooses in the soil, and um, it waits for a nematode to swim through. And then if it happens to stick its head, or indeed its tail in this place, through a noose, the noose just swells up and tightens, oozes digestive enzymes into the nematode and gobbles it up. So, plainly, it's a uh, dog-eat-dog, dog, or indeed nematode-eat-fungus, fungus-eat-nematode <laughs> in the soil. I love these creatures. Also, swimmers in the soil water, these are tardigrades. You get two kinds, new tardigrades and heterotardigrades. This one's red with armour and spines. These ones are kind of soft and squashy looking. They're also known as moss piglets, which I think is quite charming because they've got little snouty noses. <laughs> but um, so these will feed on nematodes as well. I've seen one wrestling a nematode under a microscope, which is quite interesting. But what's really interesting about these is they're a good illustration of how tough soil life can be. These creatures, when a drought happens, more or less dry up entirely, and when they do so, they spit out their mouth parts. So these are the mouth parts here, they kind of spit them out of the front. They curl up into a little ball, this is one in such a ball, and they dry out entirely. And normally, and all biological processes stop. And normally, in biology, when all biological processes stop, we call that death. <laughs> Very technical term. However, with tardigrades in this state, you can do almost anything to them. You can boil them, you can put them in liquid nitrogen, They've um, even taken them out to the International Space Station and exposed them to uh, solar radiation, unprotected. Now that stuff will shred your DNA normally. It's really unpleasant stuff. There's a reason why, why we have spacesuits, I suppose, when we go, why we don't sunbathe in space. But these creatures, not only when they brought them back into the space station, they rehydrate them with a droplet of water and it grew new mouth parts, sprang back to life, shed its skin, and in fact, actually, I think the one on the International Space Station actually laid some eggs shortly after doing that as well, after the experience of being exposed to solar radiation. Incredibly tough creatures. The longest known documented um, uh, duration of staying in this cryptobiotic state, this dead state almost, 30 years, but chances are it's probably longer. And there's been uh, apocryphal tales of them finding them in museum collections of pressed mosses from Victorian times. We need to, need to document that properly. Now, my favourites, I'm sorry to say, are these creatures. I love mites. <laughs> Four main kind of soil mites that you get. I mean, there are other kind of mites that are in uh, these sort of parasitic ones, and ones that only live up seals' noses, and ones that live in the sea, because mites live everywhere. But in the soil, you're really interested in four main groups. These ones are the dust mites, effectively. And you know, if you have uh, a little, if you don't clean your house, at the same sort of rate as I don't clean my house, <laughs> then you'll end up with these creatures crawling around. And what they're doing is, they, these are the beginning of the soil mites, I suppose, because whenever you get a bit of dust in the corner of your, your house, that's the beginning of soil, effectively. That's kind of how soil starts, is a bit of crud building up somewhere. Um, as the, um, uh, the soil begins to build up, you'll get other creatures. These ones here are much more um, associated with established habitats, so woodlands, grasslands. These are called oribatid mites. And because they live a long time and they're eating tougher food, they're not eating tasty skin flakes like these ones, they're eating much tougher food, rotting wood, dead leaves, this sort of thing. They have to live a long time and they're well armoured. And that means that they can protect their resources. So they might live three or four years, for instance. These ones might live three or four weeks. Also, you get predators. And these ones here are um, mesostigmatic mites, and we'll probably see some of these later today. They're like little tanks. They're constantly running around, constantly hunting, constantly active. They're kind of like mindless killers of the soil, just charging around constantly. Rather like sort of African hunting dogs, I suppose, just constantly... And then you also get um, these prostigmatid mites. Now, prostigmatid mites live everywhere and do everything. And they are, um, they include most of the parasitic ones. For instance, you get a few of these that are parasitic too. But these ones, again, are fluid feeders, so it'll include some of the ones that feed on plants, some of the pest mite species as well. But also the big red velvet mites and so on, and the chiggers that bite your legs as well will also come <coughs> amongst this group. We've got about 2,000 or so species of mites in this country, and I'm still trying to work out what they all are. <laughs> But however, the, one of the reasons I like them is they are superlative animals. They include the strongest animal on the planet for its size. I have to say for its size after all of these things. But um, Archegozetes longicetosus here is, um, it was capable, I don't know who did this research or how they got paid for it, but they discovered it was capable for lifting up so many times its own body weight that it would be the equivalent of me lifting up seven and a half double-decker buses. <laughs> Which is pretty impressive. But you can imagine why they're so strong. Look at this armour. That's kind of really solid, shiny, hard armour, and they're full of muscles for ploughing through the soil. But we've also got the fastest animals in the world amongst the mites. This creature here, which is um, uh, Paratonsatomus macropalpis, was clocked at running that distance in a second. Now, that doesn't seem too impressive. But zzz, that's one second. But actually, it's only well, about a millimetre long. So if you were to run your own body length, that many times in a second, that would be the equivalent of me 
running 2,100 kilometers an hour. <laughs> you can see one. Well, the, the, you may have seen these ones. These are the Whirligig mites you sometimes see dashing across pavements, and they really do motor along. And especially when the, the pavements get hot, they can really turn, put on a turn of speed. So I think somebody needs to measure some of our, our local mites as well and see if they, are, see if they can give this one a run for its money. So, fastest animals in the world and strongest animals, brilliant creatures. Um, also, we have springtails in the soil. Springtails are uh, kind of insect-like, but again, these cropped up very early on. They di diverged from the insects pretty much as soon as life on land started, so they're not really insects. But they don't have any wings, so they do have six legs and they do have antenna, which is quite insect-like. Some of them are insect shaped even, but other ones get a bit bizarre looking. This is also a springtail, looks a bit like a kind of maggot. It has got legs underneath it, you might see some of those. And we also have these ones, which are globular springtails, which um, the national springtail expert in this country, Peter Shaw, likens them to Martian racehorses. I'm not entirely sure where he got that analogy from. <laughs> but anyway, the other thing about springtails is they come in a range of sizes. This one here is our largest springtail. I'm not going to trouble you with the Latin names, it's too long. And this one here, has the fabulous name of Megalothorax minimus, and it's our smallest springtail. So this is largest meat, smallest. This is about the size of that one's eye. So this is um, probably about seven millimetres, eight millimetres long, including that. So this is a, a fraction of a millimetre, about 0.2 of a millimetre long. They're called springtails because the ones on the surface have got this structure, a fur kind of leaping out of harm's way. But um, uh, that's only useful if you've got somewhere to leap into. If you're living in a soil core and you tried to use one of these leaping devices, it would um, smash your head into the roof of the soil core. So in, the ones lower down have lost, lost their springer, there's no springer there, but instead they still need to defend themselves. So these ones have developed little poisonous glands running all the way along their body, and if they get threatened they raise up their tail and squirt poisonous chemicals at their would-be aggressor, which is normally pretty effective. The globular springtails are the only ones that have actually been on television. David Attenborough filmed these, or, you know, his unit did, and um, uh, this is because they dance. This is the female, this is the male, and they come together, and if the female, you know, likes the look of the male, she will uh, allow him to lock onto her antenna using special sort of antlers on the front of his, and they do a little kind of pushing, whirling dance going forwards and backwards, and um, whirling around and round and round. And what's really interesting about this is um, this courtship behaviour, because it all precedes the, the sort of mating, must, it happens up here on leaves, but you get the same structures on the antennae of the ones that live deep in the soil. So it's interesting to think that there might actually be dancing happening <laughs> in soil pores at a microscopic level, thanks to these springtails. Now, the balance of springtails and mites is quite a useful indicator for letting you know what's happening in the environment. So in an arable situation, you'll get sort of quite a lot of springtails, and fewer mites. I mean, that's, as, you know, that, that's the largest proportion of springtails you'll get, so not many mites. As things get more and more sort of semi-natural, tougher um, organic matter going in, things like um, pine needles or heather litter is very tough and difficult to decompose, you start to get a real increase in the number of mites. So this is data from the countryside survey, and you can see as you go through improved grasslands, you've got, you know, for arable land you get mostly springtails, improved grasslands you get a few more mites, neutral grasslands even more mites, broadleaf woodlands even more mites, coniferous woodlands, huge numbers of mites, and by the time you get to dwarf shrub heath, mites are dominating the show. So generally speaking, the tougher things are, the mites come into play more, and that's largely because of those tough decomposer organic matter, sorry, orobatid mites that are decomposing organic matter. And of course there's a whole range of other weird and wonderful creatures. I mean, the biodiversity of the soil is astonishing. It's been estimated one quarter of all terrestrial animal species live in the soil. And um, there's only me looking after it, which is a bit worrying in this country. <laughs> Any help you can offer, much appreciated. Um, yeah, we include all sorts of things, diplura and thrips and symphyla and poropods and protura or coneheads, as they're known. Pseudoscorpions are brilliant as well. Um, there's actually a whole society of people out there looking at pseudoscorpions, so I'm safe there. So, all of these are decomposers, pretty much. All of these will be feeding on bacteria, fungi and rotting organic matter, and in doing so, we'll be recycling that for the plants. One of the reasons pseudoscorpions are brilliant, and in fact mites are brilliant, is they, they need to get around by travelling on other creatures. So this is a pseudoscorpion hitching a lift on a wood hat. <laughs> it's a fantastic photo, I've got that off the eye spot, which is uh, absolutely fantastic. But this is actually a common way for soil organisms to get around. If you sort of think, how, if you get a lump of rotting something here or a cow out there, how do the right animals come and decompose it? It's often they're hitching a lift on insects. 
And of course, you also get macrofauna, and many of these, some of these are decomposers, <laughs> slugs and snails, pests certainly, but among them are also decomposer species that just eat organic matter. Some of them, incidentally, of the slugs are actually predators as well. If you get some of the shell, shelled slugs like Testacella, that's, um, that will eat earthworms, and ghost slugs do as well. You also get other decomposers, which are um, things like millipedes, wood lice, um, and then predators over this side, staphylid beetles like this one here, and nature slug pellets. These are the hunters of the slugs and the snails. And you get big ones for big slugs and snails, and little ones for little slugs and snails. Also, some of the geophilid centipedes, there's really long, thin, blind centipedes you might see if you're turning up soil in your garden. They're also important predators, on top of the mites that are also predators. And also we get these horrible things. And I'm allowed to say they're horrible because these are alien invasive species. That's an Australian flatworm. And it's one of many species of um, antipodean flatworms that are coming over into this country, gradually spreading out from the garden centres where the plants get imported into, into people's gardens and out into the wider countryside. And in Northern Ireland and Southern Structure, they make channels through the soil, but they also create new soil aggregates. Now, what we have here is a way of grouping the earthworms to understand what they do. Um, these ones here are more or less entirely red or entirely brown. And we call these epigeic earthworms. It means they live outside the earth. And you can imagine if you live outside a lot, you get a tan. So that's a way to remember it, really. If you've got a fully tanned worm, then, I mean, it's probably actually partly to do with ultraviolet protection, but also to do with camouflage as well. If you're going to live outside in leaf litter, it pays to be dark coloured. It doesn't matter to these chaps, though. These ones, or chaps and chapesses, because of course they're hermaphrodite. But these um, earthworms are completely pale and pasty, and that's because they don't get out much. They're like the sort of um, snooker players of the earthworm world. And they. Um, <laughs> They spend all their time just going forwards and backwards through the topsoil. They very rarely come out onto the, onto the top, and when they do, it's often just because it's rained, and I think they've got a bit waterlogged, or they're trying to disperse a bit, trying to make a, a dash for it a crop before the birds come back again. Um, we also then have another group, which has got a pale tail and a dark head. Now, given that these ones spend all their life deeper in the soil, and these ones are on the surface, you can make a guess at what this one does. <laughs> this one keeps its tail in the ground and it pokes its head out and forages. And these are the earthworms that dig those deep vertical burrows that go down into the soil, live inside those burrows, they're permanent burrows, they're always maintaining them, always improving them, always building new chambers and new branches to them. And then they'll poke their heads out and forage around and pull stuff towards the top of their burrows. And you sometimes see little piles of leaf litter or piles of stones even that the worms have gathered around the tops of their burrows. Also worth mentioning these stripy worms, these are compost worms. They'll turn up in dung pats. I don't know how, I don't know how they find the dung pat. <laughs> But they'll also turn up in compost heaps as well. So wherever there's a pile of rotting organic matter, they'll get these stripy compost worms. And sometimes in those compost heaps, and indeed other piles of rotting organic matter, you get tiny little white creatures. And those are potworms, enchytraeids. They're relatives of the earthworm, but they're very much smaller, and they can be really important, especially in more acidic soils, taking over the job of the earthworms, but just on a much smaller scale. So those are our four types of, well, four types of earthworms and one honorary earthworm enchytraeid. And all of these fit together in a food web. So this is the most important thing, energy entering through plants. Plants still the most important soil animal, coming down, or soil organism rather, coming down through leaf litter and also through root exudates, and they're spreading out that energy throughout the, the system, going through the bacteria and the fungi, which begin to decompose the plant material, make first use of the, um, of the organic matter that's going out, and then these being fed on by the protozoa and the nematodes. The roots themselves being fed on by nematodes, the fungi, mycorrhizal fungi being fed by the plant, and decay fungi feeding on the plant. So different ways in which they can use that carbon, but it's still all plant carbon getting used. And then from that, an even greater diversity of other creatures, decomposers coming on, feeding on the fungi and the rotting organic matter, and then predators coming on to feed on them. And what's also interesting is the earthworms kind of miss out all of that by going straight from being decomposers of the leaf litter, and then very often get gobbled up by vertebrates, but often these vertebrates are above ground. So here's a, a route whereby the organic matter can actually, from the plants, goes into the soil. It's not lost, it's actually still being used as part of the system. So this is feeding the wildlife via the worms, effectively. So if you haven't got much wildlife on your farm, you think, well, how much energy is going through to that? Come back to that later. Of course, there are other bigger animals in the, um, in the soil. Mammals, are, I've got, there are mammal specialists in natural England. People like big furry things, so I tend to skip over these to some extent. People don't often like these big furry things. <laughs> Certainly not the, the golf club where I stayed last night. But anyway, so yes, mammals also, of course, do have an important impact on the soil, but the mammal that has the largest impact on the soil <laughs> is this one. <coughs> and, um, yeah, we have had a huge impact on the soil. We've come along the last, couple, last million years. We've had um, human species knocking around on the planet. The last few thousand years, we've had agriculture. But remember, these soils were doing perfectly well without us for 400 million years. So what has our impact been? 
And what, in fact, does the soil do for us as well? Because it's worth thinking about, you know, we are mucking around with the soil because we think we know how to run it, but that's because we want the soil to do stuff for us. So what does the soil <coughs> do for us? Well, this is a, a list of what we call ecosystem services. They're jobs that the environment does for people. <coughs> And this was pulled together by a government report, and I thought it'd be very interesting to have a look at all of these different, um, you know, services that are provided by the environment. And it's food and fresh water and climate regulation and all this kind of stuff, erosion control, flood regulation. And I thought, what if we got rid of all the ones, all of the jobs that soil biology does for us? And that's what we're left with. Now, I don't know about you, but you can get a lot of regulation, you know, recreation and tourism to go and see a, a desolate landscape. Maybe I don't know. You might see some um, fire hazard regulation, perhaps if there's nothing growing. <laughs> I don't know. But on the most part, we're missing food, and we're missing clean water, and we're missing climate regulation. We're missing all of the really important stuff that keeps life on land alive. So I think for that reason, we can say, well, okay, soil biodiversity is going to be important, but how is it doing that job? And how can we ensure that our soils are healthy? I think a lot of talk about soil health, and people have tried to define it and say that you know, a healthy soil must have all of these, you know, must tick all of these boxes. And it's very difficult to define a healthy soil because people ask different soils to do different things. A nature reserve manager will want different things from his soil than a farmer will want different, you know. So that, it seems to me that the big question is, does the soil do what you want it to? That's the key question for soil health. And if the soil isn't doing what you want it to, then it must be unhealthy. So from an agricultural perspective, because I guess I'm talking mainly to, to farmers here, um, what do we actually want from our soil? Well, I think we'd like rainfall to go into the soil and be drained away so we don't end up with waterlogged fields so we can actually get onto the, the, the land and, and do whatever operations are required. However, we also want the soil to hang onto that water so that we don't end up with droughty soils. And certainly on the sort of chalk down on either side of the wheel, that's the main problem really, how do you hang onto the water? All agriculture produces a certain amount of, of waste, all human activity is producing organic waste of one sort or another, and we need the soil to decompose that. However, we also want the soil to store carbon. So we want it to de decompose the carbon and store it at the same time. That's a bit of a juggling act. So it's got to drain water and hang on to it, and decompose carbon and hang on to it. That's a bit difficult. We're asking a lot from soil. We also want the soil to release nutrients so that um, uh, our crops can grow. However, we don't want them to release nutrients all the time. We only want it to release nutrients when our crops are growing. <laughs> and if we, we also want the soil to hang on to the nutrients so that they don't wash out when we're not using them. Again, it's a tall order to ask from soil. We also don't want our soil to harbour any pests, or too many pests at least. And also, we want our soil to stay put. We want it to have a good enough structure so it doesn't wash off the hill, it can support our machinery, and it can, it can you know, avoid causing pollution problems elsewhere. So, quite a tall order to ask from soil. Can it deliver? Well, actually, yes, it can. And it's soil biology that delivers all of these things. I'm going to start off with soil structure. And it's worth having a little think before we go too much further about soil structure. We've seen the sand, silt and clay and organic matter and air and water that makes up soil aggregates and soil structure. How does that come together? How is that created? It doesn't just magically spring together. The only way that that comes together is when organisms stick it together or when you get a collapse of the soil structure. And I've got some, this is a picture of a, a, a slab of soil that I've got out there and I'll just talk you through it now so you can interpret it. This is a an undisturbed soil profile that I dug out of, of the ground about four years ago. I've now left it completely alone for four years. I've been feeding it organic matter at the top, and the worms have been going up and down through it and mixing the organic matter all by themselves. So it's, not, it's undisturbed by me, but the worms have been disturbing it in their own way. And as you can see, it goes from being dark brown to getting paler down there, and there's a good crumb structure throughout. This is what the soil looked like just before I ploughed it most recently, and by ploughing it, I just take it out and shake it up in a bag. You can see the... Um, the soil structure has actually, every soil aggregate has collapsed and smudged into the next one. And that process is now just beginning to happen again, because I've only just ploughed it up again. But you can see what's happened here. It's, it's actually gradually compacting into a lump. Now if I came along and smashed that lump up, I'm not sure that would actually be the same as these soil aggregates. So these soil aggregates have been put together inside a worm by squashing together sand, silt, clay, organic matter, air, water, to form an aggregate. These ones here, if I just snap that up, that's a totally different process, isn't it? And actually, they have totally different properties. And the more I snap it up, the more easily they collapse. So, soil structure. How does soil biology deliver that soil structure? Well, it's like a morning in a playgroup. Uh, there's moving, eating, painting, sewing, and gluing. So, if you can remember that, <laughs> go to a morning in a playgroup, what they're doing there is soil structure. Of course, it's actually a little different. But um, 
In terms of moving, I've already mentioned earthworms as being a prime uh, e ecosystem engineer. They're constantly, especially these anesthetic earthworms, moving soil from lower in the soil profile to higher in the soil profile. They're mixing it up through their guts because they have to eat the soil in order to move it. And when they're eating the soil, it's getting mixed in with all the organic matter and dead leaves that go through their guts as well and being redeposited as worm casts on the surface. So that's why you get this brown topsoil. It's really the earthworms redepositing rich organic matter and new subsoil that's being turned into topsoil by the earthworm guts onto the surface. So moving is a, a primary way of building soil structure. And of course, by moving soil from below upwards, they're aerating the soil below, of course, creating more air spaces down there. There's also gluing. Remember that slide I showed you of the mycorrhizal fungus that was dyed bright green, that was fluorescent green? That particular dye was picking up a set of proteins which are only made by these mycorrhizal fungus, and they're called glomalin-related soil proteins. And here we've got the same dye. And this is just a, a lump of, of soil, a soil aggregate, and they've used the same dye to pick up these glomalin-related proteins in that. And you can see the whole lump of soil is glowing with them. And that's because these proteins that that dye was picking up are soil glue par excellence. They're really good, they're really sticky, at sti and they're great at sticking together soil mineral particles. And you can see that this is absolutely glowing with that. So that's gluing. So lots of other organic matters, lots of waxes and other compounds in the soil are very good at gluing soil particles together. But then on the outside of a soil particle, much better if you can varnish it to keep the water out, because actually it's collapsing water that, uh, um, when water gets into a soil particle, it's that which lubricates it and causes it to collapse. So if you can varnish it on the outside with a layer of bacteria, these bacteria are actually slightly waterproofing, and they're really um, good at keeping the water from getting into the soil particle and causing it to collapse. And then, of course, we've got sowing. Plant roots and fungal hyphae stretch around the soil aggregate, binding them together. I've already shown you that photograph before with the soil particles being bound up by that. So the fungi are sowing it together. Now, the final one, eating, is actually the kind of opposite. It's how it, how it breaks up. Because if you smash up a soil aggregate, it will have had a bit of soil organic matter trapped in the centre of it, and it will be um, broken open. And the moment that soil organic matter is broken open, then bacteria, who I remember are very, very good at breaking down almost every organic compound, will come in and start to decompose it. And there'll be a, an initial flush of bacteria rushing through all those broken aggregates and even some fungi too, beginning to break down those, that, that, that organic matter. And then they will just die again. They will die back, they will become dormant, and you'll end up with just less organic matter and smaller pieces of soil. And you can keep doing that again and again and again until eventually there's very little organic matter left that the um, bacteria will touch and very little soil structure left. This is just uh, an illustration of that glomalin um, uh, the stuff, the green dyed stuff that I, that I mentioned. This is a graph showing how much glomalin you've got in the soil and how stable your aggregate is. So that if you shake up a, a wet aggregate, how well does it hold together? And you can really see that certainly for these... Um, in that early part of the curve, there's a really clear relationship. The more of this global and stuff you have, in fact, the more organic matter generally you have, the more stable your aggregates are. And we're going to be testing some aggregate stability later in the um, in this um, in the workshop. Now we wanted water to drain through our soil, getting fed upon by bacterial feeding nematodes. So here comes a bacterial feeding nematode. It comes on, gobbles up those this mixture of even mixture of carbon and nitrogen, and it releases some of the carbon dioxide as well. But of course, it's got too much nitrogen as well. So it releases that nitrogen. Now this nitrogen may have swum in from some distance away, but it's now right next to the plant root. And then again, here's a predatory nematode coming to eat this poor little bacterial feeding nematode. And because it's eating something which has got a nice carbon-nitrogen balance, and then it has to release some of the carbon dioxide, some of the carbonous carbon dioxide, it's got too much nitrogen. It needs to release that nitrogen. Again, more fertilizer for the plant. And it happens all the way down the food chain. So when our predatory mite comes along, there's another stage. So at every stage in the food chain, animals are flooding to these plant roots, bringing their own nitrogen in their own bodies, they're feeding on the other animals that are present there, they're respiring the carbon dioxide, and then they're releasing nitrogen right at the plant root at exactly the right time. And of course, the plant controls when it does its exudates. When it's growing is when it does its exudates. So actually, it's releasing it not just in the right place, but also at the right time. So as plants grow, they put out more root exudates, they encourage all of this to happen, and the plant is effectively being fertilised by all of the soil organisms that are coming along to feast on this bonanza that's happening around the plant root. And you get really high, the hot spots of biodiversity and biological activity every plant root. Mycorrhizae, I've mentioned, is another way that nutrients get through to the roots. I don't think I need to, um, to, to dwell on that anymore. But um, the next question was about um, decomposition and carbon storage. How are we going to square that circle? We've got, well, actually, it's, it's quite neat because the majority of stuff you put in the soil rots away. Soil is a terrible place to put something you don't want to rot. <laughs> Why people, it's always slightly odd that people think about soil as 
for good places for storing carbon, because actually they're terrible places for the most part. However, what happens is if you put something with a lot of um, uh, relatively new sort of plant material in, relatively recent, like this, this oak leaf, then uh, all of the easy stuff to decompose, all of the sugars and the proteins and so on, there's a lot of that going on in here, will get decomposed very, very quickly. What does that leave? It leaves the tough stuff. It leaves the lignins and some of the celluloses and so on, and those take a bit longer to decompose. So rapid decomposition with most of the carbon already gone, then a minority of the carbon left, which decomposes more slowly, and then what happens at the end of that? Well, actually, you get some really tough stuff. You know, really complicated organic molecules that may have actually been through a few soil organisms first as well. And this decomposes incredibly slowly. And the thing is, if you keep adding more of this stuff, of course, you lose most of it. But you keep gaining more and more and more of this stuff. And over time, what happens is this. So this is our fresh leaves. These are our intermediate pools. And this is the really tough stuff. And what happens is, to begin with, of course, it's mostly dominated by the fresh stuff. But over time, because this tough stuff stuff decomposes so slowly, you actually end up with most of the carbon in the soil being this tough stuff. And provided the inputs remain the same, it actually ends up levelling out as well. And this is a very sort of simple version of a, a model, soil carbon model, that um, you know, agricultural and soil scientists use to, to explore how soils hang on to carbon. But this is effectively what happens. You end up with these three different pools, and inevitably, always, the recalcitrant, tough stuff, ends up being the majority, and it always ends up balancing out. So you can't kind of keep pouring organic matter into soils forever. Even peat soils eventually will begin to level out in terms of the amount of carbon that they can store, because they'll still be decomposing ever so slowly. Now this tough stuff is good for other things as well. Remember we are talking about nutrients supplied to the plants through the mycorrhizae and through that soil food web happening around the roots. It's also really good at hanging on to nutrients. This tough soil organic matter is a great nutrient store. So this is covering the nutrient storage angle. Um, and they've got lots of little negative charges on here, and it's really good at hanging on to nutrient cations. And we want those to be stored in the soil because a plant can come along, a plant root can come along, and it le leaks out a little bit of hydrogen ions, acidifying the soil slightly, which knocks off these nutrients and enables them to get hold of it. So that's how plants get nutrients off this. It's actually like a little sort of holding bay for nutrients for plants. And the other thing is, apart from the fact that it lasts a long time, doesn't get eaten by bacteria, it's also very hydrophilic, it holds on to water, and again, plants can get hold of that water, maybe through a mycorrhizal fungus, but maybe through the plant roots themselves. So we're getting water retention and nutrient retention covered by this stuff that is only produced by soil organisms. This effectively comes out of the back end of all those springtails and mites that we're going to be looking at. Now in terms of pest control, remember around that root there was a lot of biological activity, there's effectively a, a, a kind of brawl going on with everything eating everything else. Imagine you're a, a plant parasitic nematode coming along to feed on that root, you're going to find yourself in a maelstrom of biological activity, <laughs> including all your worst enemies. There'll be mites about to eat you, there'll be tardigrades about to eat you, there'll be predatory nematodes out to try and eat you as well. So actually, it's very difficult for them to get a toehold in, uh, the, uh, in, the, in the plant and actually start infecting the plant when there's so much activity going on. Generally speaking, nature abhors a vacuum. If you've got no activity happening around your root and a plant parasitic nematode comes along, it will be able to proliferate. If you've got lots of activity, it's going to find it much harder to find that niche. And that's how the biological pest control works in the soil. And generally speaking, the more biodiversity you have, the better a soil works. There's a really nice experiment where um, this chap, um, Marcel van der Heyden in Holland, um, filtered out different levels of soil biodiversity using different filters. So effectively down here, we've got you know, bacteria even gone. they have used such a fine filter. Up here, you've got everything, earthworms. And he looked at various different soil functions, looking at nitrogen turnover, decomposition, how much carbon the soil could store. And as you knock out more and more and more of the soil creatures, the soil gets worse and worse at doing these jobs. And this is simply because it doesn't have all of those different tools in its toolkit in order to carry those out. So that's a neat experiment. And just to be able to show all of that on one graph, I think it's a lovely, lovely way to do it. So what do we do to soils in order to look after them? Because now we know that they're important and we know they do all these important jobs. In fact, all of the jobs we need soil to do, more or less, are delivered by soil biodiversity. So how do we treat the soils? Well, we do enjoy smashing them up, and we have done ever since. It's because I think we have this idea that you can make a soil aggregate by snapping it up. And that's wrong. It's a little bit wrong-headed. You need to think about soil aggregates being built rather than being smashed. And um, when you don't just smash up the aggregates, you're losing the soil carbon, you're causing an initial flush of biological activity, and then post-flush dormancy. And so that's one thing we like to do. We also tend to plant monocultures. Now, in that 400 million years, there haven't been that many monocultures of plants growing on soils. They've, generally speaking, been a diverse 
community of plants with lots of different root exudates and lots of different um, litters going in and lots of supporting many different routes of, of decomposition. So a really diverse food web. Monocultures are an invitation for pests. Is there anything we can do to avoid monocultures? We also are quite good at using um, uh, rather broad spectrum chemicals. Neonicotinoids have already been um, uh, identified as being extremely damaging to pollinating organisms, but in fact they've also been shown to um, damage earthworms, damage nematodes, and damage springtails, and lots of other soil organisms as well. So, uh, to be honest, this is something that um, you know, more work is probably needed on in order to establish the, the, the damage that is being caused below ground on, in the field by neonicotinoids. But I think the absolute worst thing that we can do to soils, and we do it a lot, <laughs> is to take away its food. Nothing can survive without a source of energy. And by carting off all of the organic matter, and this is a big problem in the, the arable east of the country, whereby all of the straw gets carted off to the west of the country and sold over there, and none of it returns. There's a kind of gradual drift of organic matter from the east to the west. And the problem with this is, quite simply, um, food. in order to function, you need fuel. Now, another way of thinking about how much fuel goes into soil is thinking about how much fuel, how much food, how many calories, if you like, we take off. So here's a graph showing during the 60s and 70s, we were kind of flatlining a bit with um, yields. And then somewhere in the mid 70s, yields increased dramatically. And now they're kind of flatlining again. Okay, now this is wheat yields. This is an indication of how good we are at getting calories from photosynthetic activity from the sun. And, um, uh, and I think what's really interesting is if you have a look at this and compare it with the uh, kind of wildlife indicator, this is the Let's see if we can do this. Yeah. This is the decline in arable um, farmland birds, basically. And you can see, we've well, only got the graph as far as here. I've had to scrunch it up a bit to overline it. But here it kind of flatlines for a bit. We actually have a bit of an increase in farmland birds there. Maybe associated with a poor harvest. Too many. But as soon as this line starts going up, this line starts to plummet. So there's our farmland bird specialist line, this blue line here. And it actually more or less follows exactly, and then it starts to flatline again, more or less at the same point that the wheat yield starts to flatline. Now, could this be, and um, this is a correlation, so could this be because we've become so good at taking energy from the environment that actually there isn't enough energy left in the system, there aren't enough calories to support a diverse farmland bird population here? What other evidence is there to show this? Well, I thought, well, what's this got to do with soil as well? Well, soil is kind of the dustbin of energy. If there's energy in the system and it trickles through, eventually, remember that decomposition graph, it will end up being stored as organic matter in the, in the soil. If there's any spare energy, it ends up eventually as organic matter in the soil. Oops, let's just see if we can get... Yeah, there's the soil graph. So, you can't see this, but these dots actually do have error bars on, and these are significant declines. What we can see is, ever since the beginning of that agricultural process, there's been a gradual but significant decline in the amount of soil carbon in arable land, and that's on the basis of the countryside survey. So it might not be happening nationally. In fact, in the west of the country, it's probably going up because of all the organic matter that's being shipped out around urban areas, of course. There's lots of compost going into those. But in arable land, at least, this is now gradually declining. So actually, this is the sort of final barometer. If you, keep, if you take away the energy supply from all of the natural processes, then you actually end up with lower soil organic matter, and that's a kind of canary in the coal mine thing. Well, it's not a very good canary because it takes such a long time to respond. The birds are better canaries, <laughs> you see. But anyway, that's just the overall picture. So we're actually seeing the whole system potentially running out of energy because we've become too efficient at farming. We're not giving enough back to the system. But we should do because soil life works for us. I hope I've demonstrated that. And they've been called, soil organisms have been called the, so the biological engine of the earth. If you think of them like that, engines need fuel, and if you want to refuel the soil biology, you need plant carbon. And that's really the sort of take-home message from all of this. And if you don't, well then the soil will stop working. Now in some systems, when the soil stop working, it stops working, it can be disastrous. This is the, um, a picture from the Dust Bowl. This is uh, an area about the size of, of Britain, basically blew away in the 1930s. And this was following an encouragement by the uh, US government at the time to subsidise the purchase of tractors so they could go and plough up more and more of the prairie and put it down to wheat. They didn't realise that the organic matter that had been built up in the prairie had been built up over thousands of years by plants with roots that went 12 feet deep into the soil. And this is why they were drawing those pictures I showed you at the beginning. But because they've... Um, lost that soil carbon, they lost the soil organisms, they lost the plants that were supporting the soil organisms, and the soil structure effectively just collapsed and blew away. And um, uh, half a million people 
um, basically lost their homes, and that three million people actually had to leave the area just as, because there was no, simply no, no way of living in this environment, even though their homes weren't buried in sand like that. They actually ended up having to, to, to travel thousands of miles and go and live in, in other places. So this was a total environmental disaster as a result of not letting soil biology do its job. In this country, our soils are a bit more forgiving, but I think some of the recent flooding, beginning to see, is actually mainly to do with poorly functioning soils. Luckily, soil life is tough. They've been able to mend some of those prairie soils in the USA, and I think we can mend the soils in this country. Um, the reason I say soil life is tough is because it's adapted to tough conditions. I, I dug up a little tiny tuft of grass, that tuft there between the paving slabs, in my, in, just outside my kitchen at home. And I found a really wide range of different soil organisms. Some of them were just topping it out. That's a, a, a rotifer that's waiting for good times to happen again, so it can spread itself out like that. I also found an extremely rare springtail. It's only been found twice before in the country. Um, I suspect people haven't been looking at tufts of grass <laughs> outside their back garden, outside their kitchen door. So anyway, soil life is tough, and it will actually come back and spring back to life if we feed it. So does it work? Can I prove it might work? Well, here's again more correlations, I'm afraid, but we've got... Amount of organic matter in the soil, so that's the amount that's going into the dustbin of the soil, I suppose, if you like. And this measure here, which looks terribly complicated, is effectively a measure of the amount of soil biomass. It's a measure of the um, lipids in the cell membrane, so don't worry about that. But as you can see, at the bottom of the graph, you don't have to increase the organic matter very much before you start seeing a really steep increase in the amount of soil life. And as you keep adding more and more organic matter up to peat over here, you don't tend to get such a steep increase. But down at this end, you don't have to add much in order to see a steep increase in, in the amount of life that the soil can support. What about physics? Well, that's biology. This, what about physics? Can we improve the, the structure of soil? Well, this is bulk density. This is how much soil you can fit into, how much solid soil there is in a space. And the more there is, the more density the soil is. The less there is, the more air and water there is, effectively. So again, as it goes down, these soils are fluffier and lighter. As it goes up, these soils are harder and heavier. So here, at 2% organic carbon, they're actually quite high. You can see it goes up as a kind of curve. That curve is a, is a, is a you know, it, it goes up quite steeply here. So you don't have to increase the soil carbon very much before the fluffiness of the soil begins to, to increase. Or in fact, you know, the amount of air and water increases and the amount of soil per unit volume goes down. So again, steeper at this end, not so much impact when you keep throwing organic matter at soil that's already got a lot in it. What about moisture content? Well, actually, from the countryside survey, they measured 100, 500 sites, lots and lots of soil samples, and if you put all of this together into a graph, you actually just get a really neat graph between the amount of water in soil and the amount of organic matter in soil. It's mostly controlled with organic matter. So you increase a small amount at this end, a small amount of organic matter, you can dramatically increase the amount of water that your soil can hold. Now here it's probably not so much of a problem, but again, on droughty soils, sandy soils, chalky soils, that's a real issue. And finally, what about cation exchange capacity, nutrient retention. Again, it's not quite so steep, but it's certainly a steeper curve at the bottom here, and it flattens out up at the top here. So the more organic matter you get, all these graphs are the same with organic matter on the bottom, a small increase at the bottom will cause a, a disproportionately large increase in some of these youthful soil functions, in other words. So big improvements in soil function due to small increases from low soil organic matter is the kind of take-home message. If you're at rock bottom down here, you don't have to do much to make things better. And that's good news from the point of view of soil. Can we demonstrate it then? Benefits of soil organic matter. There have been altogether too few um, research programs looking at the impacts of just organic matter on soil. It's very difficult to, um, to tease out the nutrient effect because most organic matter has got nutrients in as well. But this is one that tried to do this. It's called DC Agri and it's run by all of these people. And um, what they did is they had seven study sites looking at long term addition of organic matter and more short term addition of organic matter on different systems and looking at yields, among other things, but also at soil properties. And in terms of the soil properties, even in the short term, when you added it to an arable soil, you'd end up with increased total nitrogen and increased extractable nutrients. Brilliant. So you actually managed to maintain that cation exchange capacity, even in the short term with this. Also, lower penetration resistance, so slightly less dense soils. In grasslands, you've got all of those, as I said, but also increased cation exchange capacity. And um, I think that's ameliorated pH. I don't think it might actually have gone down a bit potentially because organic matter is quite acidic. But in terms of the long term additions to arable, not only did you get all of those benefits, but you also got a decrease in bulk density, available water content, rejection in shear strength, increase in porosity, and an increase in, micro in soil biomass as well. So we managed to impact the soil with all of these um, uh, additions, and what they added compost and digestate and manure and slurry and all of these things. And to be honest, they did much the same job. If we look at yields, you can see they added all of these different kinds of compost, and all of them, more or less, 
increase yield by, because that's the just using fertiliser, the same amount of nutrients that were going in with the composts and all the other ones. So this is the impact of the carbon that's happening. And this is happening at two of the site's devices, and oh no, three of the site's devices, Aberdeen and Terrington, where they looked at, um, at, these, at these additions. And you can see it's a sort of between 6 and 12% increase in yield that's due just to the organic matter that they found. So yes, it works from the point of view of yield, in these cases at least. And a while ago I was involved in a study where we actually went out and interviewed farmers and said, have you changed your management to increase the amount of organic matter going in? And if they had, they, we, got, uh, we did a sort of economic interview and tried to kind of cost out what the costs and benefits had been. And on the whole, improving your organic matter management across all of these farms resulted in an increase in profitability per hectare. But look, in terms of, I mean, it goes from £69 per hectare in an arable situation, but in a mixed farm, 84 livestock farm, £98 per hectare. Now, this is bundling together a whole load of different um, approaches, so quite difficult to tease out exactly what the benefits were coming from. But on the whole, farmers aren't generally reporting that they regret putting more organic matter into their soil. And in fact, they're generally reporting benefits. So how are we going to do that? How are we going to put more organic matter into soil? Because it doesn't grow on trees. Well, actually it does, of course. <laughs> <laughs> organic matter also grows in cover crops. If you've got bare soil, there's nothing growing there, then that's not capturing organic matter. So if you've got any bare soil that you can put something on, cover crop, a grass lay, something like that, that will be capturing organic matter that would otherwise not be going into the system. And I like cover crops. Catchment sensitive farming type people who are interested in diffuse pollution like it because they capture nitrates and, and prevent leaching over winter. But I also like it because it, um, it puts more carbon into the soil, and it actually is leaking out root exudates all through the winter as well, which will help to support all those microbes, potentially also the mycorrhizal fungi as well. They found if you plant a, a winter cover, you actually get more mycorrhizal, well, you get mycorrhizal fungi kind of coming over into the, um, into the following crop as well, especially if you don't plough it up at the end. That was the main thing with the mycorrhizal fungi, if you can spray it off and direct drill instead. And of course it also prevents erosion and runoff, those roots are binding the soil together as well. So cover crops we like, or anything similar to that, not leaving bare soil. And it does work in terms of putting more carbon in, I mean it's often not spectacular. This is a study that looked at using radioactive carbon, of all things, to try and trace the, what happened to the carbon from the cover crop. And this graph here, you see this black line here is where it started, and in both cases, either with the direct drill treatment, these purple lines, so that there was a general increase in soil carbon, especially at the surface. But even where you incorporated it with a plough at the end, it just increased soil carbon, but just a bit lower down in the soil profile, because that's, that's soil depth running there. And it wasn't a spectacular increase. It only went from 1.1% to 1.2% organic carbon. And you think, well, actually, what was the point of that? All this cover cropping, what's in, what we managed to achieve? But in fact, actually, that difference, because of that, remember at the bottom of the graph? If you make a small difference at that low end, it can make a big difference to the soil properties. That doubles the, the water content, water capacity of that soil, and actually gives you a 2.5% reduction in bulk density, according to those graphs that I showed you earlier. So actually, not bad, probably worth it. Another way you can increase organic matter going into the soil is grass. Grass is wonderfully inefficient. I like livestock farming on grass, because livestock farming on grass, people often say, oh, it's a really inefficient way to produce calories for human consumption. I say, well, actually, that's quite good, because it means there's uh, a lot of calories going into the system that will help to support the soil functions as well. So grasslands, generally speaking, have fewer soil problems than arable, arable soils. So putting your soil into grass for a few years will help. This is a study looking at, from 300 farms across the, the, the country, looking at how many years they've been in grass and how much organic matter there was. And from that, you can see you actually get about 1.6 tonnes per hectare of, um, of carbon going into the, into the soil from the grass. Of course, you can always not plough it up as well. I've mentioned that's better for the, um, uh, for the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, but generally speaking, globally, min-till or no-till soils have got more soil carbon in it and stronger soil aggregates than those which have been um, disturbed and ploughed up on a regular basis. Um, uh, and stable systems can have quite a lot more. However, having said that, it's not necessarily a panacea. There's been recent studies that have shown that actually in this country, a ploughed up soil can contain just as much soil carbon. It's more to do with what you put in than how often you disturb it. I still prefer this though because it doesn't chop up your earthworms and it doesn't chop up your mycorrhizal fungi. And I do like earthworms. But generally speaking, if you are, I mean this is from the same study, if you're running a, a no-till or min-till system, you could, it's hit or miss whether you increase the soil carbon for the first 12 years, and then after 12 years, everything is in that increased soil carbon 
part of the graph. Now, if you can be prepared to wait 12 years to see your impacts, then, uh, then go for it. There's probably other benefits anyway, in terms of fuel usage and in terms of earthworms and in terms of mycorrhizae. So by all means, go for it. But the thing is, is it's not going to be an instant win in terms of soil carbon, necessarily. So that's something else to, um, to bear in mind. However, many people, uh, maybe talk about um, uh, the impacts of soil structure on, on no-till later when we're looking at some of the, some of the soils we've got. We can make crops more diverse as well. We can um, try to do the intercropping, under-sowing. Even ryegrass and clover is a, is a more diverse crop. So, uh, you know, try to increase the range of different exudates. There's ways that we can do that. But the big question is, is, is it actually working? How can you tell if you've managed to improve your soil biological function? And actually, the easiest way, because I've explained soil structure is built by soil organisms. If you've got a good soil structure, then your soil biology must be working pretty well. The only exception to that is if you're on a chalky soil, and if you've got anybody farming on chalk. But um, generally speaking, the, you can look like good soil structure in a chalky soil, even when it's not, because the calcium glues the clay particles together. But on all other soils, if it looks good, then it is good, pretty much, and that's a good way to think of it. However, if you want to dig a little bit deeper into it, um, uh, you can actually try measuring the soil organic matter content. This doesn't change very rapidly, but Comparison between different areas of the farm can be quite interesting. It can show you where perhaps you need to target your manures or other organic matter treatments. And the way it's measured is simply you just set fire to the soil, where before and afterwards, and, um, uh, and then see what's burnt off, and that's the loss on ignition. But if you can compare that to within your farm, that would be helpful. But also, there are some published data showing that um, soil organic <laughs> matter depends quite strongly on clay content. So if you've got very clay soils up at this end, you'd expect quite a wide range of organic matter. So if you're at this end here of the clay soils, you could stand to improve. If you're up at this end, then you probably don't need to. However, if you're at this bottom end of the clay soils and you go over to a sandy soil over here, that's actually the top end of the sandy soil. Other things you could look at, see how rapidly water drains into, um, uh, into your soils. I've got a set of drain pipes that I use just bopping into the soil and and see how, how rapidly that, that, that works. That's a, a nice one because it's a real soil function. You have to measure it quite a lot and you know, get your friends around for a soil infiltration party. Bulk density is another one that I quite like as well because it's, um, it's a good measure of how compacted the soil is, how much air space. You can calculate how much space there is for soil life to live. Talking of soil life, you can measure actually what it's doing to some extent. These are basic laminar sticks. They're like little um, uh, like plant labels with holes drilled in them and you fill them up with, with bug food. I use ground up porridge and stick them in there, and um, the ones that get cleaned out uh, show soil activity, and the ones that don't um, show less soil activity. So here's, we've got an active surface and a less active lower soil. Here we've got the soil where the activity is spread out more. That one potentially has been ploughed, for instance, so it'll have more, more porosity lower down, but less higher up. You can also look at litter bags, so actually leaving things out to decompose and then reweighing them. Lots of soil scientists have published many papers on that. Some people even started using tea bags as a result. <laughs> And there's a, a program. Unfortunately, they need to be um, plastic tea bags, which I'm not sure I approve of. And another thing to do is actually ask the, ask the locals, look at what's living in the soil. And um, this is really where I, I spend a lot of my time, going down microscopes of creatures like this. But in intensive grasslands, where there's a lot of high nutrient turnover, you tend to get big, juicy creatures that live short lives, eat quickly, breed quickly, die quickly, and get eaten by other big creatures. So big, juicy creatures tending to in indicate a rapid nutrient turnover. When you have something that's a bit more um, tougher, a tougher environment to live in, where the plants grow with tougher stems and leaves, and they take longer to decompose, there's more protective compounds in there, then you get these kind of creatures, small, brown, nut-like creatures that have to live a long time. So just looking at that, you can see that this one here is a you know, semi-natural grassland full of tough grasses. This one here, full of juicy ryegrass and clover. And the way, the way we get these out, I've just put a little picture down there of some Tolgan funnels. Like, there's actually one out here, so you can see that, so that working, driving little creatures out so you can collect them. The problem is identifying those creatures, and um, uh, so uh, obviously we can't all spend all our time gazing down microscopes, sadly. So um, what we've been now de developing are techniques whereby we take the whole community, turn it into soup, and then just look at the genetics. <laughs> and in doing that, you can actually pick out differences between those three you know, different habitats. So we've already started to do that. And this is some of the, the results that we've got here, which is a load of gibberish, but um, bioinformaticians know what to do with it. So really the challenge, I suppose, now for me is, is to... Um, uh, people often think about soils as being a black box. They know what happens if you do something to it, X, and you know what happens as a result of it, Y, what happens in terms of the function, but you've no idea why. No, so there's a black box that we haven't yet opened. And yet, by using these genetic approaches and by having a look at the soil biology, that's what's in the black box. 
problem is, is we don't know how we're impacting on the soil biology. So we need to bring these two together, and that way we'll really understand soil. So in um, conclusion, really, it's just worth saying that soils have functioned for 400 million years without us, and that soil organisms are hugely diverse. I hope you've got a flavour of that from the talk today. And soil life carries out many of the important functions that keep us alive. Life on land would not work without, it, without soil organisms. And they won't work without organic matter. That's the simplest thing. Fuel for the soil, organic matter goes in there, the soil will work, the organisms will do their jobs. And cover crops, manures, grass, herb, lays, they can all add organic matter to improve the soil and potentially improve yields as well. So it's good news all round. And in terms of trying to understand whether you've got good biologically functioning soils, keep a spade handy, dig a pit, that's the simplest thing to do. If the structure is, is good, then the soil biology is functioning well. And if you want to dig into any of the um, other sort of techniques that I've, I've mentioned today, then uh, by all means come and, come and ask me. But we'll actually try a few other ones as well um, this afternoon. So in the meantime, thank you very much. I shall leave you there with my email address in case you ever need to get a hold of me. Rattled on for too long as well. <laughs> anyway, stretch your legs, we'll get some tea and coffee back. Um, I'm surprised if anyone can guess what this organism is as well. <laughs> <laughs>